to capture all different perspectives, you know, just in, talk to the people that were there and know Elvis personally. So any story, no matter how small, is like important to us and our viewers. So happy to have you guys both. I just want to start with like an intro about how you know each other because I know you're related, correct? And just give an overview of where you kind of fit into the family tree and about the Blackwoods. I know your father is my first cousin. Right. So that I'm your second, you cousin. My second cousin. That's right. Neil's father is Ron. Right. Is that right? That's right. Yes. <laughs> and Ron is my first cousin. That's right. And Ron and myself and Ron's brother, R.W., are, we're all uh, first cousins. Well, Ron and R.W. are brothers. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and Neil is a son of, our, of, of Ron. Ron, and yeah. And there's a born. whole lot of Blackwoods out there. There's yes. Tons of other Blackwoods, but not too many of them sang with Elvis. I'll say that. No. Right. So, and Terry, I know your dad, Doyle Blackwood, is that correct? Yeah. He was one of the founding fathers of the Blackwood Gospel Quartet. Can you talk right. a little bit? about that and maybe some of like your early memories with your dad and Elvis, if you have anything well, to share about that. Um, in 1934, the Blackwood Brothers Quartet was organized down in uh, Choctaw County, Mississippi. Uh, there was a Roy, the oldest brother, 10 years later, nine years later, my father Doyle was born. And nine years later, the youngest brother, James, was born. By the time... James was born. This is kind of complicated. <laughs> We're going to uh, need a diagram. <laughs> by the time James was born, Roy had married Susie, and they had a son named R.W., and, and then a, a younger son named Cecil. Daddy was the original master of ceremonies for these guys, and he, was, he always would, would joke about that. He would say, so you had Roy, James, and Doyle, and R.W., Roy's son and R.W. was about the same age as his older uncle or as his uncle Jane. You understand that? Yes. So, okay. yeah. So daddy would say, we are the only group, us four men are the only group you will ever hear or see that is comprised of three brothers, two uncles, two nephews, a father and a son. <laughs> no, that's impressive. <laughs> Yeah, and they were none of them were over five feet eight, as their mother was only four feet nine. The Blackwood brothers' mother was Carrie, okay. and their father was Emmett, and they were all short, and but very fiery, very feisty. They loved people, and they loved to sing, and they loved to share of the goodness of God. And uh, every everywhere they went, they just thrilled the people. They had this close harmony that uh, was very unique. Brothers normally can blend better than non-related family. Mm. And so they had this unique blend that people just loved. They'd never heard it. And the Blackwoods would get together and or do their songs, sing in the local churches down in Mississippi. And people had never heard anything like this, and they just loved it. They were tired of the older, prodding, slow hymns. And then you heard these little these little men singing these up tempo songs and they just loved it. <laughs> it was it was a, a a wonderful beginning for a long career which began in 1934 and how many years is that now? 90 years. I mean almost 90 years. Almost 100. Wow. Yeah. Wasn't there a string ensemble with the family as well before that? Yes. Uh, the Blackwood brothers father Emmett, I think he played the guitar or the mandolin. All of the brothers of the Blackwood Brothers, the, the uncles of the Blackwood Brothers had a little string ensemble and they sang, and mainly they just sang around the house. They, they did have a string ensemble, I know that. I have a picture of that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I did too. I, yeah, I think I couldn't locate it though. So Terry, you said that everyone in the family were musicians or singers. Is that like a rite of passage, just, you know, to pass the time by you guys is learned inst instruments. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about growing up? Well, when I was seven, my father put me on the piano and said, I want you to practice 30 minutes a day. And there was a great incentive to do that because if I didn't, I got a spanking. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So I started piano when I was seven, and I went all the way through college studying piano, classical piano, by the way. So my instrument of choice was the piano, and it served me well for later on when I sang with my father in a little local group in Memphis while I was going to Memphis State University. I sang with him in a group called the Memphians, and uh, we had a local television show there every Sunday morning. I sang the baritone. My father, Doyle, sang the lead. And we had uh, a tenor, uh, Burl Pilot, and the bass was Chalmers Walker. And we made two albums while I was in college. And a year after I was joined that group, I got an offer to sing with the Stamps Quartet. And oh. the Blacker Brothers had bought the Stamps Quartet Music Company. This is kind of involved, but... Uh, the Blackwoods, James and and JD formed the group and I was the baritone. We traveled around for about a year and a half with me singing baritone. And after a year and a half, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. So I quit and went back to college and finished college at the University of Memphis. Very nice. And Neil, how was your childhood as well? Was it also instilled in you that you had to grow up and learn music and be part of the musical legacy of your family as well? No, and I didn't know about my family <laughs> until much, much later. It's a involved story. Um, I was um, given up for adoption as a baby. And, okay. um, and uh, my grandmother thought that my father and my mother were way too young to get married. And so they took me to Nashville wow. and had me adopted. And so many years later, I found my father and my uncle. And my uncle in Memphis said, oh, I know your dad. I worked with your dad. And, you know, wow. I'll call him right now. And then they called him and he was working in Pigeon Forge, uh, you know, with the show there. And um, when they uh, when he heard that he didn't he goes, I can't even believe that this is happening. He goes, I've been looking for you for years oh, and uh, knew that you were out there, but I didn't know if you were alive or what had happened. And, uh, and your mom and I tried to get you back, but it was too late. And, uh, you know, and uh, anyway, uh, so when I found dad and, uh, you know, my uncle, and the whole family, uh, he offered, uh, he wanted me to come up there and work for him. And so I did. I moved to that area and started producing their shows and, and uh, engineering for their live show. And uh, so we, you know, to get to know him and, and, and catch up on lost time. So um, that's how I entered the family. Oh, my gosh. I, I did not know that. But yeah, but what's really strange, it's like I, I saw them on TV. I used to go and watch the Imperials because I, I went to school with Gina Mascheo, you know, uh, uh, Joe's daughter. And we would go and watch movies together and stuff like that. And so I, and he would invite us to go see the Imperial shows. And I had no idea. I always had a feeling, you know, of some connection there, mm -hmm. but I had no idea you know, what it was. And I always thought there was some kind of connection to Elvis in my heart. I guess a lot of people do feel that, but I felt it real personal and I didn't know why. And then when I found out the whole story, it all made sense. It was like, oh, well, I guess God was telling me, you know, that was what all this was. And, <laughs> you know, that was, it was quite, you know, like it was pretty powerful, you know, to find out. So I love that so much. Wow. How old were you when you found that out? I was probably, it hadn't been that long, probably 15, 20 years ago. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's incredible. And were you doing music prior to that? Absolutely. And see, that's another thing. And, and I used to see the Blackwoods on, on TV and everything. And, and, you know, of course, saw Elvis. And I actually was had done editing for Sun Records, you know, for Elvis, you know, Elvis Recordings. And I actually was an engineer at RCA, you know, where <laughs> that's Elvis crazy. recorded. That's and, cool. um, yeah, so I was there, you know, and it was just so 
wild, you know, to how it all unraveled. And I, I actually worked, engineered with the uh, the Jordan Airs, J.D. Sumner, you know, and I got to, you know, meet everybody and they were, you know, just real nice and everything. It turns out, you know, that <laughs> had a pretty strong connection there too, you know, because uh, J.D. took care of my dad, you know, he, they, he was like, I don't know if you know the story about my grandfather, you know, my father's father. You know, he died in a plane crash in 1954. And after that, uh, you know, he he really didn't have, you know, he didn't have a father. So Jay Sumner kind of took him under his wing, uh, from what I understand, and um, and really became like a surrogate dad and really looked after him a lot. So there's a a whole nother story there. So I, I'm sure you're aware of that, Terry, are you? I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't know that. Yeah. No. He's, he's that's the one who was responsible for bringing dad to Pigeon Forge. Really? That's, yeah. that's, that's great. Yeah. Do you want to share a little bit more of that story? That's interesting. I've never heard that either. Terry's aware of the fact that dad got in trouble for taxes, went to uh, prison and after prison, he got out. JD said, "You get on on the bus. I'll pay for it. You come up here to Vision Forge, and I'll put you to work working for me." And and JD really was good to him. So, yeah, and Elvis was good to Dad too. I mean, uh, Elvis asked my dad to uh, refinish his piano, the white piano that's in Graceland, and that's with Jackie Marshall's piano shop in Memphis. And so uh, Elvis said, "Okay, I want." Ron to refinish it and I'll pay to d have it done. And then Elvis used to come over there. Dad said he, he used to come over there at three o'clock in the morning. And when Elvis was up. <laughs> that's, that's on Elvis's, Elvis's daytime. <laughs> yeah. Elvis uh, stayed up all night and slept during the day. I think. That's right. He wanted to see the progress on the piano. So he'd, be hang he'd come over on his motorcycle and hang out and just watch you know uh, dad work on the piano so yeah it's the white piano with gold trim if you ever yeah that's currently in, in graceland in, in the yeah, music yeah, room today that, yeah jackie marshall's piano right. shop and, uh, and that's, dad in that's in memphis somewhere neil that's a memphis yeah, store yeah, at graceland i think and I'll yeah in the where that room, is yeah i yeah. believe that they still service that piano to this day yes so that's they interesting do that yeah, he um, kept coming over there and he wanted dad to refinish it. And so Jackie was working to show him how to do it. And dad was doing the work on it. That's the backstory on that piano. <laughs> wow. I love that. That's yeah. awesome. I did not know that. Back to Cherry, your childhood. Um, I was just reading some stories in past interviews that you have done talking about Elvis. And I think you mentioned in one, one of them that Elvis lended your dad his pink Cadillac on occasion to drive in Memphis. Could you share a little bit about that and, you know, why Elvis would give your dad his pink Cadillac? Because that's my favorite car of his. And that's so cool I, I that your dad was... got to rent or use it <laughs> yeah. or drive it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I first met Elvis, I was, I think, 12. My father, Doyle, was running for the state legislature out of Shelby County. We didn't have a car. They said, um, this coming Saturday, we're going to have a parade down Main Street. But, but we would like for all of the representatives, the nominees, to, to ride in, in a car down Main Street. So my daddy called Elvis because Elvis was such a, such a fan of the Black Brothers. And he said, Elvis, do you have a car you could lend me for the upcoming parade? And Elvis said, sure, come on out. I'll let you have it. So wow. I, I rode out to Graceland with, with my daddy. as when I first met Elvis. He was so charming and said, here it is. So he, lets, he let us have the car. And the following day, we were riding down Main Street in Memphis, Tennessee. And my father was there with his family. And we were, he was the only candidate riding down Main Street in a pink Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, people remembered that and they voted for yes. him because he won. <laughs> That's <Awesome>. amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
I'd be well, they probably were like, Well, this is Elvis's car, and Elvis knows Doyle Blackwood, so therefore yeah. we're gonna, you know, the connections if, and if, we're voting for him. If Elvis <laughs> liked him, I like him. That's all they exactly. Know. <laughs> yeah, where I where I am currently in Memphis, um, we have a condo that we rent as like a vacation house as well. It's a block from Main Street, so I'm very close to Main Street downtown in Memphis yeah. right now, which is yeah. so cool to just picture that Cadillac going down that street. <laughs> right, right. You know, Elvis loved Cadillacs. It was his favorite car. Uh, and he, he owned, he bought several of them in his life. But this one's very special. I'm glad they, they kept it uh, on display for the people to come to, who come to Memphis to see it. Can you talk a little bit about just like maybe your gospel career and how it turned into, because I know you eventually started singing with the Stamps and then the Imperials, which then ended up singing with Elvis on recordings and then also in Vegas. So I know you have like a long kind of like line there, but can you kind of talk about just in a high level, like how you got started and kind of like what that, that tract was like for you going from gospel to Vegas? <laughs> well, I graduated from university of Memphis with a degree in business administration and a minor in music. When I got my report card back then, I was making C's in business and A's in music. <laughs> so I that sounds like Elvis too. Maybe it shouldn't go into business. Maybe I should go into music. Three, actually, it wasn't three months after I graduated that I got a call from Joe Mascheo of the Imperials, and he said, "Would you be interested in joining our group?" He said Jake Hess had been ordered by his doctor to get off the road, and so Jake has recommended you to sing the lead. When Jake left. Uh, Gary McSpadden decided he would leave as well. So they called Roger Wiles to sing the baritone. Roger's from uh, California. And so uh, I had to think about it for a week because I knew it would change my life forever and talked it over with my daddy. And he said, I think you should do it. So I joined the Imperials in 1967 and Roger Wiles sang the baritone. And we started out touring as the Imperials. And uh, the first year we had 80 dates canceled because everyone was so used to seeing Jake Hess. Jake Hess was considered by many to be probably one of the two top lead singers in gospel music, along with my Uncle James. So people were disappointed that Jake wasn't there. And so... Uh, we had a bunch of dates canceled, but we also slowly began to pick up new dates in the, in the meantime. So by the end of the first year, we were pretty much breaking even, uh, not losing any money, but not making anything. And so by the second year, we really began to develop a following because we developed a more contemporary style of music. And uh, I was doing the arranging for the group and by the second year, we had done Imperials Now and New Dimensions, and we were really developing a following. We were singing all over the country. Uh, early one morning, Joe Mascheo, our manager, was in the office early, and the phone rang. It was before any of us had gotten into the office, and it was a man named Elvis calling. He said, <laughs> Joe, he said, I have been listening to your New Dimensions record and your Imperials Now record, and I love the sound of the group. Would you be interested in singing with me in Vegas, because I'm opening in July of 1969? I'd love to have the Imperials. I've already got the Sweet Inspirations, and I've got the TCB band, and I would love to have the Imperials join me as well. So Joe thought about it a minute, and he said, what? Well, Elvis, would you give me a minute so I can ask the guys? So he turned around to the empty room. None of us were there yet. <laughs> and he said, guys, would you all like to back up Elvis in Vegas in two months? <laughs> he got back on the phone with Elvis and he said, Elvis, they all nodded their head yes. Because <laughs> he's like, there's no way they're saying no anyway, so no. I'm just going to answer for you. Yeah. No, uh, I would, you know, and, and and Joe was a visionary. He he saw the potential of working with Elvis when we didn't. 
but uh, Joe Joe was uh, so charismatic and such a, a warm and friendly guy. Elvis loved Joe, and he knew he would love the group because he'd heard the records. Well, in the meantime, we went to Los Angeles, and we rehearsed for two solid weeks, about eight hours a day, at a a, a, a company, a, a, a warehouse in uh, Los Angeles, so that by the time we start, well, you probably have seen some of those rehearsals on, on Yeah, we've watched them, yep, for sure. Yeah. Where he's pulling up in his car, and he's singing oh, yeah. all the different songs. Yeah, the Paisley shirt, and yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we, we we had very intensive rehearsals for two weeks so that by by the time July 31, 1969 came around, we were ready. So, uh, and the interesting thing was that Elvis was very, people think he was kind of cocky, but he wasn't. He was very insecure. He, uh, he had tried, he had opened in Las Vegas seven years before downtown Las Vegas. And, they uh, and the people didn't really like it. The older <laughs> folks didn't really care for his music. So this was a another attempt to come back to Vegas and and open in the biggest hotel in Vegas. He wasn't even sure he could fill it. So, so by crazy. the time '69 July and '69 came along, uh, Elvis was there with us and the PCB band and the Sweet Inspiration. He walked behind the curtain and he was nervous as he could be because he didn't know how the people were going to respond to it. He said, he told us, he said, man, I hope they like it. He said, I, I just don't know. He said, I haven't been here in so long. I don't know if they're going to like me or not. So by the time the 2001 Odyssey started and he walked out on the stage, every flash bulb in the building went off. And the screens were just deafening, and he knew he was he knew he knew he was going to be okay then, because <laughs> the people were absolutely bonkers crazy to see, and every Hollywood movie star that that was or could be there that night was there, and it was a it was a night I'll never forget. He looked so great, he was in such great condition because he worked out all the time doing karate. And he was slim, and he had that beautiful black hair. And the people just loved him. They, they loved the energy that he brought to the stage. And he put everything into his show. He gave it all that he had, and the people loved him. for. And he could, the people could tell that he loved them because mm -hmm. just by the responses he got back from them. He, he, he would look at us and say, man, I don't know. Well, he said, I... I don't know if they're going to like me. He said, I, I'm just not sure. And he was nervous about it. So really, the real Elvis was rather shy and not real sure of himself. But when he walked on the stage, he appeared to be very confident and very assured, self-assured. And I think the responses that he got when he walked on the stage assured him that they were going to love him. They did love him, and they were so glad to see him because the uh, energy that night was just amazing. What was it like for you also that night, the Imperials backstage after that first show? Well, it was, uh, it was a night I'll never forget. We all had our own, we had our dressing room and Elvis had his. It was, it was just uh, very exciting. And we, we loved uh, the energy that Elvis gave to the people and gave to us and we we just were glad to be there <laughs> we didn't really ask elvis if we could sing with him he asked us so it was because he he knew that we at the time we had a really good group and uh, great sound and he knew that and that's why he wanted us on the stage with him after hours like after the performance was there an after party or what did you guys do after the show did you go back up to elvis's room show. or Okay. We had an eight o'clock show. We had uh, we finished it at ten. We had a little break, and then we came back for a midnight show. And not every night, but many nights, he would ask us if we would come up to the penthouse and uh, sing around the piano. And so, whenever he asked us, we of course agreed to come. So many nights we would be up there till four or five in the morning standing around the piano singing gospel music. 
he loved the harmonizing four and the Dixie Hummingbirds and the five blind boys. He loved black gospel music, but he also loved the Blackbird Brothers and the Statesmen. One of his favorite singers was Jimmy Jones, who was a bass singer for the harmonizing four. And we would sit around listening on the record player, listen to, listen to Jimmy Jones sing farther along. We'll know all about it. Farther along. We'll understand why cheer up my brother. And uh, then we'd go to the piano and we'd sing Amazing Grace, How Great Thou Art, Sweet Spirit. Just anything that Elvis wanted to sing, we were there to sing it with him. And I believe that Elvis said that singing those gospel songs after shows calmed him. Is that true? It really did. I think if he could, he would have rather sung in a gospel quartet than to be a rock and roll star. Don't you think, Neil? Yes, I think so. He almost did, right? With the stream fellows, right? Yeah, yeah. He um, he loved he loved the fact he never really sought to be a star. He actually made his first record for his mother. I don't know if you knew that, Gladys. He went in the studio at Sun Records and made a record for his mother, and he gave it to her. And Sam Phillips heard it and said, "I think I can do something with this boy." So he called Elvis into his studio and said, would you like to make a record? Elvis said, sure. So I think that's when the, when the Elvis Presley phenomenon started. I think one of his first songs was Hound Dog. And Big Mama Thornton had recorded that song earlier, a black woman, and she had sung it. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Really slow and prodding, rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. And so Elvis got it, and he changed it, as you know, if you heard Elvis sing Hound Dog. Mm -hmm. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> so and good. really up-tempo. <laughs> well, white people loved it. Blacks loved it. Everybody loved it. And that was the beginning of the starting of, of Elvis's career. Oops. Elvis was good at taking a song and making it his own. Taking a song that maybe had been thought of in a different way, and take, changing it more to fit himself. And it just so happened that the people loved it. He was not considered part of the in crowd in Hume's high school. But uh, I think they had a talent show and he sang on the talent show and the girls really liked him. And I think it changed everything for him after that. <laughs> he was dressed very different than everybody else in oh, high school. Yeah. And, he would yep. wear the pink shirts and the high, the collar standing up in the back and uh the guys didn't really think much of him but the girls did <laughs> <laughs> terry you mentioned like elvis's early recordings at sun and neil you mentioned that you did some sound mixing and uh, worked edited. on and you edited. edited them at sun studio can you talk about um, some of your work place, but it's for sun records um yeah, and there were gospel songs that he was singing with Carl Perkins. Uh, just mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that, Terry? Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was the one that edited it up for him. And then there was uh, Johnny Cash. Or, but yeah, Elvis was singing mostly gospel songs on that uh, uh -huh. in particular. It was awesome. That was really nice just to listen to him. Oh, I have another story for you. Uh, you, know, you know Sean McSpadden, you know Gary's son? Uh huh. I used to give him drum lessons long before I even knew that I was a black one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, isn't that something? Yeah, it, it, it goes around full circle. Uh, I have so many bizarre stories about it. You know, so. That was the de your destiny. You were always meant to find your family and your people. It's your destiny calling to you, I, I believe. It, maybe. Yeah, it seems so. God's definitely in my life and showing me things that now makes sense. <laughs> Did you guys have any more questions about opening night? I, I remember uh, Cary Grant was in the audience. And I oh, yeah, celebrities. Sammy Davis Jr. was down on the front row, stage center, and Elvis saw him right down front, and, and Sammy was just loving it. Elvis went over to him right in the middle of the show. He leaned down to Sammy, shook his hand. He took off one of the rings on his finger, and he gave it to Sammy Davis that night. Wow. And Sammy Davis just went crazy. But he just loved Elvis. Yeah. He did, yeah. 
Yeah, you see the video. I think there's even backstage footage. I don't know if it's from that first show night, but Sammy Davis is there with Elvis and the party, and Elvis is wearing just like a super low cut, but like um, leather jacket. Yeah. Sammy, yeah. yeah, Sammy's in the audience. If you've ever worn leather, you know how hot they are, and they're heavy. So yeah. And under those lights, uh, it was just really, I know that Elvis really struggled, but uh, I, I would imagine he probably lost four or five pounds after every night from Definitely. wearing those heavy leather suits. Yeah. The smell wasn't real good. <laughs> but the, Terry, the, tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> we, those are the details that we want to know. You know, what did, what did all this smell like after his show? <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> was yeah. it more on the woodsy side or no just kidding <laughs> yeah so obviously you guys sang the imperial sang with the sweet inspirations also on stage um what was your guys's relationship like with them how were how was getting to know them and singing with the sweet inspirations do you have any stories you can share about um about them uh no stories i know that uh i think elvis really first wanted the blossoms but the okay. Blossoms were doing a lot of studio work and they turned him down. I would say that our relationship with the Sweets was always good. Uh, the original lead singer for the Sweet Inspirations was... Um, Whitney Houston's mom? Yeah. Uh, Sissy. What's her name? Uh, Sissy, yeah. Yeah, Sissy mm -hmm. Houston. Whitney Houston's mother. Sissy was the original lead singer for the Sweet Inspirations. And Myrna Matthews beautiful girl, Sylvia Shimwell, and uh, Estelle Fanning. Estelle, not a Fanning, Estelle uh, Brown. Estelle Brown. And, uh, but we always had a great relationship with him. Whitney's mother only lasted one month. She didn't really want to do that anymore, so they brought in uh, Sylvia Shimwell to take her place. Mm -hmm. But we always had a great relationship with the Sweet Inspiration. They were always, they loved to hear us we were always standing behind them and they loved to hear our voices behind them, supporting them as well. We had a good relationship with, with the girls. That's so cool. Yeah. And I would say that uh, having a black female gospel, gospel a female group was kind of controversial back then. I remember one night we were, we were to be in Houston, Texas at the Astrodome. And I think the promoter had gone to Elvis's manager Parker and said, we don't want the sweet inspirations. And Elvis told him, told the, the promoter, well, if the sweet inspirations aren't on the stage, then I'm not going on the stage. Yep. You, is that, is that what you heard? We've heard that before. Yes, that's yes. True. Houston, he did that several times actually in history with other black artists as well. If uh -huh. they were not going to take the stage or if they are not going to be in a concert, he also said that I'm not performing. Right. Right. Yeah. Does, uh, Black black music was as much a part of Elvis's life as, as as the white quartet music. So it was an integral part of who Elvis was, and he wasn't about to to deny the sweet inspiration. They uh, allowed the girls to sing, and the the crowd loved them. Yeah, part of my life too. You know, I'm sure it's yours too, Terry. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I remember going to. Um, a huge black church in Memphis about once every other month, uh, they had a, what they called a convocation. And it, it was uh, a very unique experience. And I'm sure Elvis was over there as well uh, from time to time. So, I mean, the golf, black gospel music has always been a part of my life and, and Elvis loved it as much as, as I did. And uh, it, it was a powerful influence on his life. I have a question for you, Terry. Uh, who started the, the the quartet necklace thing? Do you think that was Elvis? This is the like the then my uncle made this one. <laughs> the the TCB. Blackwood. It's this is Blackwood uh, necklace. That, oh, I don't even have one of those. That uh, my <laughs> uncle R. W. Does that mean I'm illegitimate? I just wanted to know. <laughs> I just wanted to know. A lot of quartets have their own necklaces, and I'm just curious. Well, uh, I, I didn't you know, like that. the TCB. Did he? Did he kind of start that? Well, Elvis gave us, uh, it was, I don't think the first month, I think it was the second time we were there. He gave us each uh, a little TCB necklace that I have in my safe. And I won't I tell you where it is, but 
Right. Other than it's in Terry, library. what's your address? And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> those those necklaces are quite valuable now, I think. Yeah. Plus, uh, we got um, a nice little 22 karat gold watch, Bowman Mercier watch that has on the back it says to Terry. Mine says to Terry from Squirly EP. And that's in the safe. Oh, well. that was his nickname. I heard Elvis uh, had a nickname for you. <laughs> Where is you that true? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I can't confirm it's true. That's why I'm asking. It's true. I was very uh, sheltered as a child, but I also was deeply um, touched by God in my life, and I felt that it was wrong to engage in sexual relations before marriage. So I uh, got the nickname Virgin on, on one of my, on my necklace. And uh, is that the nickname you heard Benita? They, uh, they, would kid the me, they would kid me about it. And because I was so naive about things like that, but I think it proved, it proved that my, uh, my stand, my determination to be who I claim to be, proved to be very, very um, profitable for me, but also it stated a very strong message that uh, my faith was more important than being a part of the crowd. Yeah. That's so awesome. while they didn't necessarily do as I did, I think they had a, great, a real respect for me, for my stand. Definitely. And I think Elvis probably saw that too, because he I valued think. high morals and he valued people that stayed true to their word. And so I think that yeah. definitely probably resonated with him. Yeah. You know, there were only uh, three groups that ever male groups that backed Elvis. There were the uh, Jordanaires, the Imperials and the Stamps, about 20 total uh, white male singers who backed Elvis about three of them, around three of them, claimed to be Elvis's favorite gospel singer. Uh, I can't claim to be one of those three, but I can say that I was in the top 20. <laughs> Take it. I cannot even claim to be anywhere near where Elvis was, but we were both Mississippi boys. We both had very strong moral ethics, and we both grew up, we both grew up very poor. And and uh, and yet Elvis went far greater, greater heights of success than I did. But we had a lot of similar backgrounds in our past. And I think that that's part of why he related to me and why he loved, loved having me on stage. But I was the youngest guy. In fact, there were several nights after the show that I would walk through the casino back to our motel room. And you have to be 18 to be in the stu in the in the casino, and I got stopped several times by the security, demanding to see my ID to make sure that I was old enough to be in the casino. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you look young right now. I was young back then. Baby face, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to talk about that as well, because I know that when you accepted to go to Vegas with Elvis, that your father actually had doubts about it, and he was not as on board as everyone else was. Can you talk about that time with your dad? And then I also wanted to ask about why do you think Elvis brought gospel to a city like Vegas? Well, because gospel was a part of who Elvis was. If, if you got Elvis, you got gospel. You got rock and roll, but you got gospel and R&B. <laughs> So when he went to Vegas, the crowd got Elvis with all of his backgrounds in uh, black gospel music and white gospel music. So he never compromised his preference for his music. And I think that the honesty that he gave to the people uh, endeared him to all of his audiences. If there was nothing fake about him, and it was it was all genuine. Elvis was was a very genuine, uh, deeply religious guy. He was confused about some things, but he never lost sight of his background. And his mother was a was a very strong influence on his life. I, I know you're aware of that. Gladys oh, yeah. was was uh, prayed for her son, and my father 
wasn't really excited wasn't really excited about me going to Vegas, but he knew that uh, he prayed for his son and he prayed that God would protect me, and he did. I had uh, some wonderful experiences out there, and uh, we we found a church that we attended, and we we loved it. We were there almost every Sunday when we could get up in time and go. But many times we wouldn't get home on Saturday night and get to the room back until about five in the morning. So it was it was hard to go to church some Sunday mornings. I can believe it. <laughs> You're probably up yeah. until church time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you also had to walk. I know that you didn't stay at the Westgate, did you? No, we stayed at a little motel called the Valley High. It was about three blocks from the Hilton Hotel. It had a uh, a living room, bedroom, and a little kitchen. I had a tennis courts in the middle. And I was, back then I played tennis almost every day. So we had to walk back to our motel after the show. That's where we stayed. We, weren't, we, were, we didn't stay at the Hilton Hotel. I think the suite stayed there and the TCB band stayed there, but we didn't. That's interesting. I don't think that a hotel, that motel exists anymore. It doesn't. To, they tore it down. Yeah. Okay. It was right close to the Desert Inn. It was actually between the Desert Inn and the Landmark Hotel and the International Hotel. And Terry, I know you guys, you were in Vegas with Elvis until like 71. So you were obviously also part of Elvis's life when Lisa Marie was born. Can you guys talk about kind of like your relationship with Lisa Marie and any stories that you can share um, about her? I don't really have any stories about Lisa Marie. What year was she born? 68. 68. I remember her. Uh, okay. But I, I never really interacted with her much. They were very protective of Lisa Marie. Okay. And they didn't really want her to interact with us too much. Uh, most of our interaction was, was with Elvis, but we didn't really have much interaction with Lisa Marie. There's Vernon. What about Vernon? Vernon was a very quiet, uh, supportive father. I think he was just overwhelmed by the success of what Elvis had done, but very supportive of his son and very, well, supporting. He, he loved being a part of what Elvis was doing, and he was there every night. A very nice man and very, very kind to us as well. Uh, I never really got to know Gladys. Of course, she had passed away, but I I have heard that she was a very deeply uh, spiritual woman and prayed for her son all the time before she died. Is that what you heard, Neil? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, my dad would say the same thing. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, I don't think that movie really portrayed Gladys very well, and that was one of the things I didn't really care. For about the movie was it didn't really talk about the gospel side of Elvis very much. It didn't, no. No, it did not. The gospel side of Elvis was far bigger part of his life than, than that movie led on. Yeah, definitely. What about Colonel Tom Parker? Anything you could share about him? I'll try to be kind. <laughs> Never had one We've heard the stories him. too. Yeah, okay. Never had one word with him. Uh, one time, oh. Joe asked the colonel a question, and the colonel's assistant was a man named Tom Diskin. Yes. And instead of the colonel looking at Joe and answering his question, he turned to Tom Gis Diskin and said, tell him, da, 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 whatever. Oh, wow. He never even addressed Joe personally, eye to eye, but he always would say, Tom, tell them th this. The colonel made you feel like you were very fortunate, and, and we were, to be with Elvis. And he wanted us to never forget that, uh, forget that, and to remember that, remember our place, basically. I don't think the colonel meant to be that way, but I think it was just part of his nature. Uh, he wanted to always remind us that Elvis was the star, and we weren't, and we knew that. We knew we were very fortunate to be there, but we also knew that we've added a lot to his show. Probably his favorite parts too. So, well, it's, I, I would say that Elvis 
loved having us on the stage with him. I'll say that. We, we gave him a, a solid male vocal sound that he really, really wanted. And he knew that. I don't think the colonel was a, the colonel wasn't a music person. And he always deferred to Elvis for that. But Elvis got the people that he wanted to be on stage with. I wanted to also ask, what, do you have any moments on stage with Elvis or any performances that stand out to you more than some others? Well, one night there was a note that was sent backstage and uh, the note said, be careful tonight because I'm going to shoot you on the, on the stage this night. And uh, so Elvis passed that note around to his Memphis Mafia and the policemen, and they were searching around in the audience for who would have written such a note. And there's a particular song in the show called You've Lost That Love and Feeling where Elvis turns his back to the audience and the spotlight hits him on, on his back. And I think he was afraid somebody was going to shoot him when he turned his back on the audience. Uh, but that, that night, when he's saying you've lost that love and feeling, uh, nothing happened. But I think he was afraid something was going to happen because of that note. But it was a very tense night. I remember that well. He turns wow. around on, uh, you lost, he turns his turns around. That's the, the, the intro, you never close your, he's got his back to the audience, end, but then he turns around on you've lost that love and feeling. But nothing happened that night, and uh, so we were all thankful that that was an, an empty threat. It didn't really materialize. You know, what's interesting is the movie, you know, 2022, the movie portrays that maybe the colonel had something to do with that for the management side of things. Do you think there's any truth behind that? You mean to make it uh, newsworthy? Seem, yeah, like if Correct. he didn't want to leave the country and that he, you know, he was a little bit more scared and that's what they were alluding to. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think that's probably true, but there were a lot of jealous men back then. They, they didn't like Elvis, but they were, they admired him. Some of them were a little bit un, unstable mentally, you know, unhinged uh -huh. <laughs> and they didn't really, uh, they didn't want to like Elvis, but they did. And their girlfriends loved Elvis, so it was a very uh, interesting dichotomy there. Of the women who loved him, the men who respected him, but some of them didn't really like him. <laughs> it was every night was a new experience. <laughs> oh, I hear Sorry, my dog's in the background. Sorry. <laughs> Does your dog have a question? <laughs> <laughs> he, he probably does he's a very chatty dog <laughs> so terry and neil can you guys talk about what are you guys doing today with gospel music neil you want to start well i i produce and engineer and write for gospel artists and uh and that's what i'm doing now uh, with my studio here and, and I go, you know, back to Nashville sometimes. Terry, as a matter of fact, he uh, sang on a pro gospel project that we did called Psalm Space. And um, we did that at Blackbird Studios and, and Ocean Way. But yeah, that was wonderful. Of course, Terry did a wonderful job as always. And it was, it was a real treat to work with him. Terry, he, he continues to make all of his records and I have gotten to where I'm doing more solo work and I'm doing some studio work, but most of it is, I felt like a lot of the old hymns that the church were so familiar with have been forgotten. And so I'm, I'm starting to make videos of some of the old hymns that people remembered singing when they were younger in church. I still have a group, but we're not really doing a whole lot right now. And hopefully some things will open up. I'm I'm told that the there's some some future work involved, but I don't I don't know about it yet. But I'm doing these Facebook videos, and uh, they seem to be uh, received very well. And I hope that it continues. I've been okay, watching. I was going to ask you where those were at. You know, me and Margarita and Kristen, we were talking. Maybe in the future we could all meet in Vegas. Um, there's the Westgate uh, Hotel and the Elvis Suite. 
they have a beautiful piano and it's just grand up there. But it'd be fun to, I don't know, maybe we could go up there and you guys, you know, sing some gospel something gospel. together. Yeah. <laughs> like like the, the old, old times. I'm yeah. not sure Neil's a singer. Are you, Neil? Oh, yeah. I'm a singer. Yeah, I sing on a lot of these. He can records, produce it. He can I'm, produce I'm not it. like you. You're, you're the... <laughs> You're the great one. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that. I mean, it's all in the listening ear. Some people like my singing. Others have other favorites. But I, I do the best I can. Well, I yeah, don't release I mean, anything that I don't think is, is good. There's a lot of great singers in our family. But, yeah, you're you're one of them. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think like the legacy of the Blackwoods family that that we know and that like we've been introduced to is just of amazing gospel singers. So, you know, you. hopefully it continues. Yeah, I do have a website, uh, terryblackwood.com, and all of the CDs that I sang on are available on, on that website. All, all the music that I did with the Imperials was on there as well. I have some solo projects and I have the Imperials on there. My work with Andrus Blackwood and Company, a group I sang with after I left the Imperials. So I've had a lot of, of CDs that I have appeared on, probably 50 or 75 total. Wow. What's yeah. really funny is I actually uh, played drums with Little Anthony and the Imperials, which is a totally different. Really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's you know, Clarence fun. Collins is, he's still in the group, isn't he? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I told you, it's, it's real funny, uh, all the different people I've run into, a lot of musicians that worked with Elvis, a lot of singers, uh -huh. uh, you know, and over the years. And it's like, I do have a connection there, <laughs> more than, than I thought. So, yeah, it's yeah. Kind, of, kind of funny. Yeah. So your recording studio, it's in North Carolina? Yes, it is. It used to be in Nashville. I sold it. And then um, I still go back there and work as, you know, I, Told you with with Terry, we worked at Blackbird, and that was a, a wonderful experience working with Terry. And I thought um, you were still in Nashville, Neil. I go back and forth, but I, I have, I'm in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Oh, I know where it's, that is. Yeah, yeah, where the Billy Graham Training Center is. You know, close by. Uh -huh. Yeah, I got a studio here, and I'm producing a lot of different artists, and some some uh -huh. of them work in Nashville. Some of them they don't mind coming up here and working or we work over the internet like a lot of people do these days. Yeah. Um, and yeah, my website's merrickmusic.com. M E W -R, R I C K music.com. And I had that company, uh, Oh gosh, for decades now. So. No, you said that you're a composer. Are there any songs that is, there's a few, uh, you know, for the Psalm Space Project, I worked on on that with the arrangements and everything and, and getting the, the tunes, you know, fine-tuned. And then uh, I'm working, writing some songs with this artist, Julie Kinchek. She's a, a worship leader at Berkeley College of Music and a professor there. And my brother went there. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my brother's, a, he's a drummer. So he went oh, to Berkeley. Oh, really? Yeah. Music, yeah. I'm a, yeah, I'm a drummer, percussionist, and... Uh, yeah, I went to school at Vanderbilt, Blair School of Music. Oh, very cool. First, and then went to Peabody and Johns Hopkins. That's my background. I, I learned, you know, composition in school and percussion and drums. Had to do piano, but I never was a good pianist, not like Terry. <laughs> <laughs> so. And you did all of this musical education even before you knew you were a Blackwood. Absolutely. It was in my blood. I mean, literally. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, that just proved another point, you know, it, I guess it's in the genetics, you know, and God puts it in there you know, and there you are. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and you, you're one of the best, Neil. Oh, uh, well, thank you. You are. I, I just, I feel very fortunate to be related to you and, and have worked with you. Uh, Is there you. any music you guys have done together? Have you worked on any songs that we might recognize? Oh, well, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think Psalm Space really took off, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, uh, right now we'll, we'll share about it and maybe it will, yeah, you know. yeah. it, it's a Peg Luke's uh, Psalm Space project, and it, it was it was a really nice project. Um, it was uh, with with uh, parts people that were in the Nashville Symphony. 
we did symphonic orchestration and uh, along with uh, the rhythm section. And then we had people like Terry sing on it. He sang lead with uh, Lisa Bevel, who was a CCM artist. She, she had lots of number one hits back in, I think it was the, was it the eighties and nineties? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had Jenny Luke sang on it as well. And she, she works with a lot of the, the big artists, you, you name it. She's worked with them. Uh, Dave Matthews band, mm-hmm. Nicki Minaj, uh, Will I Am, Stevie Wonder, a lot of people like that. So I have a whole team of people that I work with that work with a lot of famous people. Very, very proud of them. And I can call them <laughs> anytime I need them, you know, and they're in Los Angeles. So, yeah. yeah we'll share, um, you know, both of your websites for, for your businesses on our, on our, on our description and on our channel. And so people can check them, check them both out if they want to buy your CDs and get details about your music. So that's so cool. So thank you guys for sharing that. I was at Universal. I was the chief engineer there in Nashville. I came across this tape and it was in our, the control room. I was just picked it up and I said, see the Alanis Morris set on it. I was like, oh, okay. So I picked it up, put it in and listened to it. And it was uh, Let the King Step Down, a song that she wrote with this other gentleman that worked. There was a writer there and it was about Elvis. And I was like, wow, this is really powerful. It made my hair stand up. And then, you know, find out later, you know, I, I guess she's a big Elvis fan, of, of course. And, and she was asked to sing at uh, Lisa Marie's uh, funeral. Yes. Oh, she yeah. also sang at the Grace, the Christmas at Graceland, the one that she Riley did. killed. Oh, she did? did yeah. You know Mary? I was wondering why they asked her, but that makes sense. I didn't now. know. I, I, I just figured she was a big fan and maybe friends. Yeah, I think she sang in front of the Lisa Marie. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, the plane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the right song, on. her song about Elvis, that is actually a song that is out. Or you no, just heard it? it was never released. Wow. Oh my gosh. What? Alanis, please release it if you're out there watching this. <laughs> uh, I wish you oh. would. I thought it was a fantastic song. And uh, I, I have a whole playlist. Oh. Me too. I have a whole playlist yes. about songs that she people never released never. about Elvis. And that one and I've never come across. So her wow. husband reached out to me one time. And I never heard it done. <laughs> My favorite is Black Velvet. Yeah. I really like that one. I have a, cool. I have a story about uh, one night in the penthouse. We were up there singing around the piano, and that particular night, uh, Mama Cass was there. She stood around the piano with us as we were singing our gospel songs, and she turned to Elvis and said, Elvis, why do you sing all these gospel songs? I don't understand it. And so Elvis said, well, just listen. So we started singing Amazing Grace a cappella with no instrumentation behind us with Elvis and the Imperials. And I looked over at her and she started to cry. And we did all four verses of it. When we finished the song, she looked over at Elvis and she said, now I know why you do these gospel songs. She said, I haven't heard that song since I was a little girl. And she was deeply moved by it that night. That's what it's all about. The power of that song touched her deeply, brought back wonderful memories of her past. That's sweet. I mean, even the gospel for me, I mean, I feel like becoming an Elvis fan brought me to gospel. And now I listen to gospel all day long, all the time, just because of just how much you could feel Elvis just singing it. It feels different Mm -hmm. than when he sings like a different song and you could just know he put his whole heart and soul into those Mm -hmm. songs. So it it definitely touches you differently when he sings those types of music. Yeah, absolutely. He, Mm -hmm. he threw his whole heart and soul into every song. Yeah. The Lord's in him, you know, the Lord was in him. Yeah. Yes. I came through, didn't it? Yeah, sure did. Appreciate about Elvis singing gospel songs, like in his concerts, his tours, is that he, because he influenced so many people, that by doing so, he, you know, hey, this is okay to listen to gospel music. And for the kids, maybe they grew up in families where they couldn't listen to his other music. You can listen to gospel music. So, I mean, just all around, it just benefits, it's touching. Uh, right. I love his I, I he had a voice for it all. Yes, he did. 
I mean, that's where he started. He started out singing gospel music, and he never lost his love for it. And you guys are, you have a professional music background. What are your thoughts about his range? Because he can sing so many different variations of a song. Like, he can have that deep voice, you know, and then he can have almost like an <clears throat> opera-sounding voice. And that, you know what I mean? It's, like, completely different. I think, it, uh, I don't know, Neil, I, 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 uh, I was very impressed with what he was able to do because he didn't have all auto, auto tune back then, <laughs> but he <laughs> could, he could belt out a ballad and turn right around and sing an up tempo song and do it beautifully. And I don't know if you know it, but on Hound Dog, it's in the key of C, but his first note, and he's a bar he was a baritone, but his first note, in Hound Dog is a B flat above high C. Well, not above high C, a B flat, just a step below high C. You ain't in the mud hell. That's a B flat. But he had an amazing range and such a powerful voice that he was able to do a song like that and turn right around and sing Bridge Over Troubled Waters and do it so beautifully. But it was he just had an amazing voice and a, and a very strong voice that, that he was able to keep out throughout his career. What do you think, Neil? Absolutely. Yeah, he was amazing. I mean, who, who doesn't think he's amazing? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, you had your crooners back then. You had Frank Sinatra, who was a right. wonderful singer. Oh, yeah. Amazing yeah. singer. Oh, yeah. Love, but love they all uh, loved to hear Elvis sing because there was something very unique about Elvis's voice. He wasn't the greatest singer of all times, but when you, when you pair it with the charisma and the heart that Elvis put into a song, you have an entertainer like no other. Elvis was the greatest, greatest singer oh, yeah. of all time for, for what he was able to do with what God had given him. He even gained Frank Sinatra's respect because Frank was initially not a fan, so he thought of Elvis until yeah. he was. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I you heard... know, Tom Jones and him were very close, too. <clears throat> and, oh, and Tom had a deep admiration for Elvis's voice. They, they were very good friends, by the way. Yeah, I heard that he was, like, a doctor recommended that he get a surgery on his, you know, larynx. Tonsils. Of, of some, yeah, tonsils. But he said no, because he was scared it would change his uh, I think his Tom was wise, because Tom was one of the greatest singers, too. He was an amazing singer. Still oh. sings great, too. Yeah. That's and he's cool. still friends with Priscilla, even to this day. They're very good friends. Yeah. I wanted to ask Terry, in 1955, while on tour with the Blackwood Brothers in Texas, Elvis refused to sing rock and roll out of respect for them. Do you know what that was initially about? I'm always curious on why he did that. I really can't honestly tell you. I know that when he would come to Memphis, when he would come to the auditorium in Memphis, when the Blackwoods would sing, he would stay backstage and he wouldn't... Uh, he wasn't allowed to sing on the stage. The colonel wouldn't let him. But he, he had such a deep respect for gospel music that I don't think he really wanted to sing uh, rock and roll music on, a, on, a, on the Blackwoods uh, gospel concert stage. So, yeah. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I was talking to Uncle R.W. today, and he said he was on that tour uh, where they did an all-gospel tour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, he was telling me about that. They, I don't know if you remember Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, but that's where the Blackwood Brothers, they won the show, and that was an older version of American Idol. That night, they won the contest, and they got offers to go to the Copacabana Club. Any number of venues opened up to them. In the mid '50s, that was when the Blackwoods really, really setting the world on fire with their music, and uh, and then the tragic plane crash, which changed, which happened only less than a month after they had won the show. Yeah. And uh, so, the Blackwoods' career has been long and tumultuous at times, but they had some really good years back in the '50s and '60s. 
And what people and, uh, don't realize is there were only three stations at the most on TV. They yeah. didn't have cable, no internet. You know, there was only three stations that you could choose from. Right. And, and Arthur Godfrey was on and pretty much everybody was watching it. So Everybody was watching Arthur Godfrey. Yeah. You know, you had ABC, CBS, and NBC. And then Elvis's house, he had three TVs down in the jungle room. And he had each channel on, on each t TV. <laughs> I'm sure he watched it that night too. You mentioned like obviously the plane, the plane crash, you know, with, with the Blackwood, one of Elvis's first girlfriends, Dixie Locke, she actually talks about that plane crash in her book and how it really affected Elvis. And they, there is like a bench that you could still go to in the park where when Dixie there. used to live that after the plane crash that Elvis heard that, you know, the Blackwoods were in, they went to this bench and cried because they were so upset about just hearing the news of that. So, yeah, that's well, just such a tragic, crazy story, but it affected Elvis, um, you know, immensely. Elvis, Elvis deeply loved the Blackwood yeah. brothers. And uh, I'll just say that uh, R.W. Blackwood was one of the greatest singers I've ever heard. And he was the one killed in the plane crash along with the bass singer. Yeah, that's my and, grandfather. Uh, Your they grandfather, deeply, Bill. Deeply hurt, oh they deeply hurt uh, Elvis a lot. Yes, R.W. Sr. was such a powerful singer. And he's what? Your grandfather, mm -hmm. Neil? Yes. Yes, sir. They say I look like him. And I looked a lot like him when I was younger. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, R.W. had a great range, too. He was, uh, he was considered a baritone, but he could sing above a high C and not many baritone singers can do that. That's pretty high. That's really high. Yeah. But our W What's, could do all of it. He had a, a tremendous range. What would you say your range is, Terry? <laughs> I'm a, I'm considered a lyric baritone. I'm, I think I have a higher tone, the higher I get. I bet I would think that my top note would be a G to an A flat. And then I, I have a pretty good, baritone voice down lower but I I'm, I'm, I think I'm considered a lyric baritone but I sang lead in the imperial so go figure that I don't that is so cool. well if God gives you a gift I feel like it's important that you keep working on it so whenever I'm in my car I'm singing I'm trying to keep my voice in shape I don't ever want to lose the gift that God gave me and so that's how I that's how I keep my voice in good, in fairly good shape. I also wanted to ask um, a little bit off topic of Elvis, but I know that um, your grandfather had a personal relationship with Johnny Cash. Neil, I have like stories about yeah. Johnny Cash too. <laughs> I used to see him all the time. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I got to mix one of his records. And, you know, it was a live Johnny record. Johnny Cash's. Yeah. Yeah, please share any story. I mean, our fan base also really loves Johnny I Cash. I used to see him all the obviously. time. Obviously. And his daughter, Roseanne, did a record at the studio that I was an engineer for at Imagine Studios. But another guy was actually the main engineer. I was the second engineer, which means I assisted the, the main engineer for that record. And that was me, Vita Loca. Did you get to hang out and like you met him several times, of course, or... Any stories uh, you can a share? Few times. Yeah, he okay. was very nice, very, very nice, very, very conservative to me, and you know, and very you nice. Johnny on my wall, and, on the wall. <laughs> oh yeah, Why? Yep. You know, he's he, in the, the wall back oh, there. Cool. That's awesome. It's we're just very fortunate. I feel very fortunate, you know, to be in music and and in the gospel. And, me too. You know, and me uh, too. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with it, you know, and you got to. Yeah try to live up to it. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and Can especially you with your little... last name, you got to live up to a, a huge legacy, so. And we live outside of uh, Franklin in a little community called Leapers Fort. And uh, Oh, it's beautiful there. Oh yeah, it's pretty out here. Very, yeah. Yeah, very nice. out here too. very peaceful out here. Yeah. We are at the end of a dead end street. And if you're uh, you're either coming to our house or you're lost because 
<laughs> oh, man. We love we're, like, well, <laughs> we're coming over because we want to see your TCB necklace in the safe. So <laughs> I had to bring it up. Huh? So Speaking of that, did Elvis one? give you any other gifts like that or anything else other than the watch and the TCB? Uh, a TCB uh, necklace, a watch, and uh, a bracelet. That's about I didn't get a car, unfortunately. <laughs> Would have been nice because you walked to your motel. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't get any. Uh, I didn't get any cars or Cadillacs or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered if Elvis was responsible for the quartet necklaces. You've seen those, right? That's why I was asking you before. Have you seen those before? No, I haven't. I haven't seen them. You know, a lot of the quartets would would get their own necklaces made. You know, with the you know, different types of designs. And I just wondered if that was from Elvis, you know, doing his TCB necklace and the TLC, you know. <laughs> we could probably ask Lowell Hayes. Yeah, that's probably what I should do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've spoken to him as well on our show. So, oh, that's yeah, awesome. we'll ask him. That'd be cool. That Wouldn't that be cool if we discovered something that you guys didn't know? That Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wondered you. about this, you know, for quite some time. I, I don't know why, but it's just. It no, my... that's awesome. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll help you. We love doing research about anything Elvis related. So we will, we will help you as well. Dig into that. Awesome. <laughs> Terry, I wanted to ask one last question. I know that when you did your own TV show with the Menfians, have you ever met Anita Wood in any of those studios in Memphis? No, I, I didn't. I didn't meet her. Uh, I know who you're talking about. She's the movie star. I think she was on oh, radio think, here right, in Memphis right. too. Yeah. Oh, I think she, she was on TV. Yes, no, in, in, Men in Memphis. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Anita's different. Yeah, not Natalie Wood. And Natalie Wood oh. was. The famous actress, but Anita Wood did Natalie some shows, Wood, local shows of, yeah. in Memphis. Uh huh. No, I, we never met. Never okay. met. Oh, another thing you all might want to know is my uncle and my grandmother told me that uh, Elvis went out on a few dates with my mother so <laughs> in Memphis. And that was something they told me. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Neil, what's your mom's no. name? <laughs> well, she passed away a long time ago, but her name was Charlotte Gant. Okay. Charlotte mm -hmm. Gant. That sounds Charlotte, very yeah. familiar, actually. I'd be very proud of that now. Mm -hmm. I did know Dixie my mother. Lock. You did? Oh, yeah. Dixie she Lock. Same church I went to. Dixie Lock, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. oh that's right. First Assembly. Mm -hmm. Elvis and her would also go uh, to First Assembly together. And he was even there when she was baptized. And I know he liked to sat, sit in the back so that he didn't cause too much attention to himself during the services, which I thought was That's also right. interesting. That's right. Because she was still in high school and he was like famous or what? He just... Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like he was on the verge of his superstardom. Yeah, he was out of high school. He had already had some hits, but he, he would come into the back of the church because he didn't want to disturb. But first assembly was where he would attend when he when he would go to church. Cecil Blackwood was talking about that, how he met him in church. It's on the uh, Blackwood DVD with uh, Happy Goodmans on the. It's like a there are two groups on there. It's Happy Goodmans uh -huh. and uh -huh. the Blackwoods. Have you, you've seen that, haven't you? That DVD. I don't think I have. Oh, it's really good. And James is talking on there. Dad's on there. I think it, you're on there, right? I, I think you know, are. Am I? <laughs> yeah, I think you are. <laughs> yeah, uncle's on there too, and uh, Billy and Jimmy and uh, uh huh. Yeah, the whole the whole family. Cecil. <laughs> yeah. And they go into the the thing about the plane crash and, and meeting Elvis and, and how he loved gospel music and uh huh and and, and the Blackwoods and the States. Yeah. And so it's a very good uh, DVD. I, I really enjoy looking at it sometimes that's good that's good <laughs> yeah. it was i mean they were sharecroppers which means they didn't even own the land that they worked just like elvis's and, ancestors yeah i can recall uh, i won't talk a lot about it but i remember even outhouses before electricity then, we didn't right? have indoor plumbing <laughs> yeah yeah 
Yeah, that's similar starts to Elvis as well. I mean, his family in Mississippi were all sharecroppers too. Yeah. So I, that, I guess I'm trying to kind of paint a picture of just how poor Elvis was, but we were poor as well. We, so uh, he related we tried to that. To, you know, what's that? He related to that. Oh, yeah, he did. And, and to the Blackwoods because of that. Uh-huh. Same uh, upbringing. Right, right. Thank you guys so much. Thank Is there any so last minute time. things? Yeah, you want to share with us before we wrap? Any last minute <laughs> stories you could think of? I know you shared so much, so we are so grateful for your time. Just uh, glad to be here. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank so you much. So, so much. Thank you. I know this has been fun. Thank you, Terry. Thank Nil. you. Thank you. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you all for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed our episode. Please be sure to subscribe and share. Also, follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Those Elvis Girls. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.